telephone call to an eighth floor office in that building, the headquarters of Microsoft in 1980. At about, uh, oh, about noon, I guess, I called Bill Gates uh, on Monday and said I would like to come out and talk to him about uh, his products. Bill said, well, how's next week? And they said, we're on an airplane, we're leaving in an hour, we'd like to be there tomorrow. Well, hallelujah, right on. Steve Ballmer was a Harvard roommate of Gates. He had just joined Microsoft and would end up its third billionaire. Back then, he was the only guy in the company with business training. Both Ballmer and Gates instantly saw the importance of the IBM visit. And Bill said, Steve, you better come to the meeting. You're the only other guy here who can wear a suit. So we figured, okay, the two of us will put on suits, we'll put on suits, and we'll go to this, this meeting. We got there roughly 2 o'clock. And uh, we were waiting in the front, and uh, this young fellow came out to, to take us back to Mr. Gates' office. I thought he was the office boy. And, it, of course, it was Bill. He was quite decisive. We uh, we popped out the non-disclosure agreement, the letter that said that he wouldn't tell anybody we were there and that we wouldn't hear any secrets and so forth. He signed it immediately. Now, IBM didn't make it easy. You had to sign all these funny agreements that sort of said I, IBM could do whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, and use your secrets however they they felt. But so it took a little bit of faith. Jack Sams was looking for a package from Microsoft containing both the basic computer language and an operating system. But IBM hadn't done their homework. They thought we had an operating system. Because we had this soft card product that had CPM on it, they thought we could license some CPM for this new personal computer they told us they wanted to do. And we said, well, no, we're, we're not in that business. And when we discovered we didn't have the he didn't have the rights to do that and that it was not he said but i think it's ready i think Dick gary's got it ready to go <clears throat> i said well no but no time like the present call up gary so bill right there with them in the room called gary killed all digital research said gary i'm sending some guys down they're going to be on the phone treat them right they're important guys the men from ibm came to this victorian house in pacific grove california headquarters of digital research headed by gary and dorothy Kildall. Just imagine what it's like having IBM come to visit. It's like having the Queen drop by for tea. It's like having the Pope come by looking for advice. It's like a visit from God himself. And what did Gary and Dorothy do? They sent them away. Gary was, had some other plans, and so he said, well, uh, Dorothy will see you. And uh, so we went down, the three of us. IBM showed up with an IBM non-disclosure, and, and Dorothy made what I, what, a decision which I think it's easy and wreck respect to say was dumb. Well, we popped out our letter that said, uh, uh, please don't tell anybody we're here and we don't want to hear anything confidential. And uh, she read it and she said, I can't sign this. She did what her job was. She got the lawyer to look at the non-disclosure. The lawyer, uh, Jerry Davis, who's still in Monterey, uh, threw up on this uh, non-disclosure. It was uncomfortable for IBM. They weren't used to being waiting. and. And, and it was an unfortunate situation. Here you are in a tiny Victorian house that's overrun with people and chaotic. And So we spent the whole day in Pacific Grove debating with them and with our attorneys and her attorneys and everybody else about whether or not she could um, even talk to us about talking to us. And we left. This is the moment digital research dropped the ball. IBM, distinctly unimpressed with their reception, went back to Microsoft. Bill Gates isn't the man to give a rival a second chance. He saw the opportunity of a lifetime. Digital research didn't seize that, and we knew it was essential. If somebody didn't do it, the project was going to fall apart. So we just got carried away and said, look, we can't afford to lose the language business. That was the initial thought. We can't afford to have IBM not go forward. This is the most exciting thing that's going to happen in PCs. And we were already out on the limb because we had licensed them not only basic but Fortran, COBOL, Assembler, uh, Typing Tutor, Adventure. And basically every, every product the company had we had committed to do for IBM in a very short time frame. But there was a problem. IBM needed an operating system fast and Microsoft didn't have one. What they did have was a stroke of luck, the ingredient everyone needs to be a billionaire. Unbelievably, the solution was just across town. Paul Allen, Gates' programming partner since high school, had found another operating system. 
there's a local company here in, in, uh, in Seattle called Seattle Computer Products, a guy named Tim Patterson, and he had done an operating system, very rudimentary operating system that was kind of like CPM. And we just told IBM, look, we'll go get this operating system from the small local company, we'll take care of it, we'll fix it up, and you can still do a PC. Tim Patterson's operating system, which saved the deal with IBM, was, well, adapted from Gary Kildall's CPM. So I took a CPM manual that I'd gotten from the retail computer store, $5 in 1976 or something, and uh, used that as the basis for uh, the, what the, what we, the application programming interface, the API, for my operating system. And so uh, using these, these ideas that uh, came from different places, I started in April, and it was about half time for four months I, uh, before I had my, my first working version. This is it. The operating system Tim Patterson wrote. He called it QDOS, the quick and dirty operating system. Microsoft and IBM called it PCDOS 1.0. And under any name, it looks an awful lot like CPM. On this computer here, I have running a PCDOS and CPM86, and frankly, it's very hard to tell the difference between the two. The command structures are the same, so are the directories. In fact, the only obvious external difference is the floppy drive is labeled A in PCDOS, and C in CPM. Some difference, and yet one generated billions in revenue and the other disappeared. As usual in the PC business, the prize didn't go to the inventor, but to the exploiter of the invention. In this case, that wasn't Gary Kildall. It wasn't even Tim Patterson. There was still one problem. Tim Patterson worked for Seattle Computer Products, or SCP. They still owned the rights to QDOS, rights that Microsoft had to have. But then we went back and said to them, look, you know, we want to buy this thing. And SCP was, like most little companies, they, you know, always needed cash. And so that was when they went into the negotiation. And uh, so ended up working out a deal to, uh, uh, to buy the operating system uh, from him for, for, for whatever usage we, you know, we wanted for $50,000. Hey, let's pause there to savor an historic moment <laughs> for whatever usage we, you know, we wanted for $50,000. It had to be the deal of the century, if not the millennium. It was certainly the deal that made Bill Gates and Paul Allen multi-billionaires and allowed Paul Allen to buy toys like these, his own NBA basketball team and arena. Microsoft bought outright for $50,000 the operating system they needed and they turned around and licensed it to the world for up to $50 per PC. Think of it, 100 million personal computers running MS-DOS software funneling billions into Microsoft, a company that back then was 50 kids managed by a 25-year-old who needed to wash his hair. Nice work if you can get it, and Microsoft got it. There are no two places further apart in the USA than southeastern Florida. There are no two places further apart in the USA than southeastern...